Hello and welcome to What Women Want Today podcast season three, the Soul Sister series, where we will tackle tough topics straight from our heart to yours. I'm Terry Kellams, your host and coach for women who struggle to find meaning and fulfillment in midlife. I am Amanda Keeper. I am your new regular contributor. I come straight from the Midwest, Rockford, Illinois. I'm a public speaking teacher and leadership development professor. I'm also a coach and clinical mental health counselor. I am so thrilled to be here and let's get started. Let's do it. (laughs) Hello and welcome to this week's episode of What Women Want Today podcast. We have a special guest on with Amanda and I today. Melissa, would you like to introduce yourself? Hey, um, yeah, my name is Melissa Segrew. Um, Amanda and I knew each other as colleagues working together for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know what else you want to know. <laughs> well, I'll just go ahead and jump right in here for you. And I just lost a, lost a little bit of my light. So um, hold on one second. This is going to be funny for all the viewers. Yeah. You stand up in situations like these. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Not moving enough. It's real. It's real life, right? This it's is real, real life. life right here. And I'm back. We're in, a, we're in a podcast room. So I just wanted to say a little bit about um, the fact that we're on the Soul Sister series. And Melissa is the first guest that Terry and I are actually inviting onto the show. And it's very special to me because um, Melissa has been one of my very best friends for like years and years. And we've just only grown closer over the years. Uh, I think I was, I think I first met you, Melissa, when I was on like a Tenure committee or something like that. Was that right? I was yeah, on your evaluation right. committee. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Dave Ross had invited me to be on evaluation committee because you were coming back or you had been, you know, we work at the same place, but we met sort of by happenstance, but then we sort of just like morphed and grew into this really beautiful relationship. So, Melissa, thank you for being here. Thanks for uh, me. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think I had talked about how Terry and I really, on the Soul Sister series, we really wanted to jump into uh, matters that matter to women from our heart to yours. And one of the things that Melissa and I connected on right away um, was a deep level of conversation that we have always been able to have. And so we are talking about grief this series, and this is our first, it's our first podcast in our series on grief. And we're talking about the different types of grief. And I mentioned, for those of you that have listened to the podcast before, that I lost both of my parents to cancer diagnosis. And in the midst of all of that time, uh, one of my very best friends, Melissa Segrew, also was diagnosed with cancer. And I know that there's a lot of grief associated with a diagnosis like that. And so I asked Melissa if she would come and talk about that. Um, It is something that happens more often in midlife for women. And so it fits right into our audience group. I wanted to share something with you as we get started today. From the American Cancer Society, breast cancer is the most common cancer in women in the United States, except for skin cancer. It's about 30% or one in three of all new female cancers every year. So about 297,790 new cases of invasive breast cancer will be diagnosed in women. About 55,000 new cases of ductal carcinoma will be diagnosed as well. So this is something that a lot of women face. I personally know three women right now at the same time, my aunt, my hairstylist, and one of my best friends who have been struggling with this and facing a lot of the grief that comes along with it. So Melissa, thank you for being here. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I thought maybe that you could start off by reading your poem oh, and okay. and really kind of give your listeners sort of your raw heart and then mm-hmm. we'll sort of dive in to the poem. Okay. We'll unpack it later. We're going to yes. unpack that poem. <laughs> it's one of the most beautiful poems I've ever heard in my life. And okay. Melissa sent it to me and I asked her to share it with people a while back. And I'm so glad she's sharing it here today as well. I don't, I don't have it memorized, so I got to read it. Yeah. Um, okay. Two years carrying the weight of this disease that came through my life, but left me instead scarred and aged and angry. How much longer do I need to pretend I'm not changed? How much longer before I can accept this metamorphosis of a body I no longer recognize the feel of? I hate it, this teetering on the edge of a free fall into something I didn't want. I didn't want this. I don't want this. People say it's a battle, a fight, but that's a lie. 
It's a staring contest between the before and after, the anger and acceptance, the betrayal and forgiveness. I can't yet look away. I'm not sure yet what side I'm on. I want to soar on wings that take me back to a time I didn't feel like Gregor Samsa, monstrous and insignificant. I want to remember what it feels like to be whole, to be strong, to be beautiful. I want once more to be oblivious to this constant ache in my bones and in my spirit. I want one day to look and see me again. It's beautiful. It's just beautiful. So uh, Terry, I, I have read that poem. So I want to start with you, Terry, and just what comes up for you like immediately um, in your body and in your heart as you listen to that. And I'm going to turn my light on again. That's okay. So um, a close friend of my daughter's was diagnosed a few years back and she won the first round, let's just say, and um, thought she was free and clear. Um, she was a fairly young woman, uh, just gotten married, bought a home, was looking forward to having babies. And one day woke up with pain in her hip and went to the doctor and it was, it was everywhere. And see, I'm going to be the first one to cry today. <laughs> It's, um, it's such an unfair disease. My husband, um, always likes to say like, it's the very thing that gives life. And it's the thing that also takes life. And, you know, a woman, <laughs> a woman is so wrapped up in, um, how she feels about herself and to have something, have something that's so horrible to your body and so disparaging to your spirit is just heart-wrenching it's just a heart-wrenching thing to watch and a heart-wrenching thing to learn about and I I don't care how many people you learn about having it it never changes it's always it feels like fresh grief for that person every single time yeah. and that's what I was thinking when she was reading it and I I noticed that you picked up on the word spirit and Melissa in your poem you talked about um, what it did to your spirit and mm -hmm. Um, that you never wanted this, you didn't plan for this, this was a shock to you. Mm -hmm. So I kind of want the uh, the listeners to kind of go on a journey with you. So I, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to kind of ask you to take us on that journey from discovery to processing to um, finding out that you are right now cancer free, and you're in the clear. Um, so you can, can you take us back to like finding out and what that process was like? Because for so many women, that in itself is traumatic, the waiting game, the, mm -hmm. you know. Right. Um, yeah. So mine started um, <laughs> on my 50th birthday. Mm. I went in for a biopsy because um, my previous scan had shown just, I I come from a family of women with dense breasts. Okay. So, um, and so a lot of times I would have to go in and have like an ultrasound done after the fact. And so I'd had an ultrasound done. They felt like there was just a dark spot that they wanted to biopsy. So on my 50th birthday, I go in for this biopsy and, um, and like all of us, right. It's like, well, last time I went in and it was fine. So here's hoping, you know, so the day after they called and said, so it's cancer. And, um, and I'll never forget the nurse who called me said, did you suspect, like, I feel like you maybe, maybe suspected this. And I was like, well, I was hoping not, but uh, I mean, you never know. Um, so anyway, it was just, it's an unreal moment, you know, when you finally get, get news like that, even if you do kind of suspect. Um, so then I am the type of person that in, I'm in, <laughs> now that I know, I'm like, I want to find out all the, all about it. I want to find out, you know, like I want to see the diagnoses now. I want to see, you know, all of this stuff. I want to make a plan. I'm going to have a plan now. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how my husband and I, after the initial shock wore off, we're like, okay, what's going to happen now? What's, you know, what's going on? So I'm assuming this is probably similar in, in other areas, but the, the um, hospital that I went to, they actually set me up, you know, they said, this person's going to call you, this person's going to call you. And so I just had to wait for the doctor's 
offices to call. Um, when in, they felt like it was probably something small. Um, so my first visit with the oncologist, we ran through all of the options. Here's what's going to happen. We can probably just do um, a lumpectomy and then, then we'll check it. You know, if it's anywhere, they check lymph nodes, blah, blah, blah. Um, kind of have a plan. So now I'm feeling like, okay, cool. We've got a plan. I know what's coming. Went in for an MRI and um, found out it was much larger than they expected. Um, and, you know, one of the things that's great about doctor stuff right now um, is that you can see everything, like you can get into your chart and you can see all oh. that stuff like immediately. But at the same time, sometimes you're like stuck looking at it and going, I don't know what I'm seeing. Now I have to wait. And so I got the MRI thing. I saw the results in my chart and I could just tell I'm like, this doesn't sound good. Mm -hmm. And um, so interestingly enough, I mean, you read those statistics. It's crazy to me how many, how many women end up, you know, with breast cancer, but just the, the amount out there. And once you're in there, um, you know, just seeing all of the women, but most breast cancer, I think the most common is that you feel a lump mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's in the ducts. Mine was actually what they call lobular um, it didn't present itself as a lump. It was just kind of a thickening of the skin, um, which is why once I got the the results back, it was so much larger um, because they said it's the type that kind of hides in the breast tissue. Um, so anyway, so once that just kind of threw the whole timeline off, it was no longer you can go do this. We now had to um, I had to do chemo treatments ahead of time so that they could try to shrink the tumor and make it smaller so that when they went in to take it out, um, it would be easier. And um, so, so yeah, so I, that was, my birthday was in November. By January, I had had my first surgery for um, checking the lymph nodes, putting in the, the chemo port, started chemo in January. Um, Ended chemo in May, um, had my double mastectomy in August of that year. And this was all the height of COVID 2021. I'm so glad wow. you mentioned that. I'm so yeah. glad you mentioned that. I wanted you to tell that part of the story because you're yeah. already isolated. It was already one of the most difficult years of your life. Right. Right. So, yeah. So that just made, I mean, everybody at that point is feeling isolated and, and we're all feeling grief from just losing our lives due to this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, so then on top of it, I'm dealing with this, you know, my doctor literally told me, you cannot go anywhere. Once you start chemo, you cannot, you know, you can't see people. And yeah, and I just, yeah. So in, in when I was going through chemo, I had, um, my family actually came by once, and this is in the middle of winter, and we couldn't gather in the house. Um, so they actually came to visit me because they knew I was struggling, not being able to see anybody. And we sat outside in the snow and everybody was bundled up, you know. <laughs> so um, Melissa, Melissa, if you don't mind me asking a quick question in there, because you mentioned the word grief. And, mm -hmm. you know, for, for our listeners, I just, I want to quickly just, you know, there's five stages of grief typically, mm -hmm. right? And they are denial, anger bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure you weren't thinking about it at the time, but now as you look back and you're telling your story, do you see, do you see all of those steps like playing out in your story? Oh, definitely. And I think for me, part of that wanting to make a plan was part of that was part of the denial phase. Like, okay, if I can just figure this out, then it's not going to really be so bad. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. So I think that was just kind of part of all of that. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and maybe even part of that bargaining. Bargaining. Like, yeah. I was thinking just that too. Do this, you know. Yeah. Um, uh what does it feel yeah. like? What does it feel like when you get that um when you have that discussion with the doctor that says, um, we're going to remove both your breasts? What does that feel like as a woman? 
And also I wanted to ask, was that a, uh, did they tell you you had to do that or was that a choice? Yeah, that's a great question. It, it Removing the one side was pretty much a given. Sure. Um, they gave me the choice. I didn't have to remove both, but I have a sister who also went through breast cancer. Okay. So I already had it in, you know, family history. Mm -hmm. And because of the type of breast cancer that I had, it had a, I think a higher percentage of coming back. Um, and I just didn't like the odds. Mm -hmm. And so I elected to have both removed. Okay. Um, yeah. And it, so I'm sorry. So when you decided to have both removed, can you tell the listeners what was the exact diagnosis and stage? At that point, because of the size mm -hmm. um, and it hadn't actually gone to a lymph node, um, there's a sentinel node that they check, which is like the very first um, lymph node that it would go to, that it had microscopic. They said it was just like the most, you know, like it had maybe just gotten there. Mm -hmm. So it hadn't traveled anywhere else. So I wasn't stage four, but I was at stage three. And there's a whole bunch of like other little things that they put along with that. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was considered stage three, mostly because of the size. I think it ended up being about five inches, mm -hmm. um, like total size wise. So, so yeah, you're right. I mean, at that point, having to have both of them removed, um, I remember before then kind of looking at myself and I had gone to the plastic surgeon, um, you know, at, before then too, just to kind of map out like what he would do. And honestly, that probably brought in, um, like the grief was very tangible at that point for me, standing there and, and listening to this doctor, you know, describing what he would do and where he would cut and, you know, like, and drawing on my body and it was kind of an, almost an out of body experience. Like I could see, it was looking at myself as just, I don't know, a thing, not as me, you know, right. but just kind of a thing. So was there any like sense of like um, betrayal? Cause I'm thinking like, I only, I have four daughters. I only nursed the last daughter and I remember what an amazing experience that was. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I would wonder if a lot of women wouldn't almost look at that, like, you know, like you betrayed me, like looking at your body in the mirror and thinking oh, you betrayed absolutely. me. Yeah. And probably not at that point. Okay. I think the biggest thing for me in all of this, because after I had the double mastectomy and, you know, I had to wait and then I had to go through radiation. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I had, couldn't do my reconstruction and stuff until after that was done. And I had a terrible time with radiation. Um, and so my reconstruction actually got delayed a bit. Um, I'm actually, you know, this is now I'm going into my third year. The reconstruction that we did failed. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and so now I ha I'm looking at in August going and getting a completely, you know, new surgery procedure done. Um, and so I think for me, that betrayal is, it's, it's all of it. And it's the fact that I had to like give up my timelines. Like, I, you know, like everything I thought about this whole process just kind of went out the window and I was at literally at the mercy of my body. Mm -hmm. And I felt like my body is in so many ways just fighting against me, you know? And on the one hand you go, okay, I'm lucky because they were able to get it all. Um, I'm, you know, at this point in the clear, but like you'd mentioned earlier, there's still that sense of, you know, well, for now, mm. <laughs> you know, like I'm in the clear for now, even looking at this next surgery, I think part of me is a little worried. What if they go in there and they find something again? You know, like I, I no longer know, like I no longer trust that my body is, you know, something I can rely on. And mm -hmm. probably too, in all of that is that with the chemo, um, you know, my doctor at the very, very beginning said your process, and I think this is important for anybody that's going through it, your process is going to be your process. Like 
it's going to be your experience. It's not your sister's experience. It's not your friend's experience. It's not anybody else that you know that have gone, has gone through this. It's going to be your experience. And um, I had a really, really hard time with the chemo. It, it affected my muscles in such a way that I was in constant pain mm. going through it. And I'm still recovering from that. And the other thing with, I mean, all of that stuff that they tell you, I mean, all of the women who have gone through breast cancer and everything that we should know about it because it's so prevalent, there's so much that you don't hear about. I mean, the fact that chemo for me put me into menopause, you mm. know, like I, I wasn't that way ahead of time, but I am now, you know, and when my hair grew back, it grew back all white. It was just all of those things that I wasn't prepared for. Well, yeah, that's why it's, I mean, it's just extra special that you're willing to share your story because it's, it is painful and, you know, we don't know a lot about it. Um, from, from your point of view, obviously we hear our stories, we can read articles and stuff, but this is just such a, um, an individual personal experience and, you know, anything that we can learn from another woman is always going to be helpful, even if it's not exactly the same. But, um, one of the questions I had for you was, do, do most women go through chemo and radiation or was it due to the type of cancer you had or can you talk about I, that a little bit? Yeah, I think um, I think part of the standard and, and probably unless unless your cancer is just something that is um, like stage one or stage zero where it's just found and it hasn't gone anywhere. I think the standard is that you would have a certain round amount of chemo and then some radiation Radiation for me was, I had to do it because, again, the size and because it had just gone to that lymph node. If it's gone to a lymph node, then you, then they say radiation, you really need to do. Um, it's just kind of an extra, I guess, precaution. And um, are, are all women a candidate for the reconstruction? Or I think, I, I feel like I've heard that sometimes women don't have enough tissue and they're it, like... They yeah. just don't even have that option. Yeah. And I, it's again, too, it's like, don't realize how many options you have for reconstruction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I did the, where they put the spacers in during my mastectomy. And then I had to go regularly to have um, uh, saline injected into the spacers mm -hmm. until it stretched this, basically stretched the skin back out because, you know, with the mastectomies, it's removed. Mm -hmm. Um and then once it's stretched far enough, then they can put implants in. Okay. So, but the one that I'm going in to, to do now, because that one didn't work, is they're going to take the fat and stuff from my stomach and they're going to gonna... recreate breasts with my own, you know, which then I won't need implants, which will be wonderful. Yeah. But if I hadn't gained all of my menopause weight <laughs> I wouldn't have the stomach roll for them yay to menopause, yay, menopause. <laughs> yay chocolate cake <laughs> yeah so oh. so yeah so they said that you know women who are very thin um you know their options are limited mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. I had um I had implants several years ago and that was um one of the one things that they they talked about doing was the the fat and um I didn't have my menopause fat yet then. So <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't an option. So, you know, like, like a lot of women, depending on the type of implant that you have, you have to have them, your implants replaced like every 10 to 12 years. Mm -hmm. Have they talked to you about that as well? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah. So, so yeah. Melissa, clarify for me. So when you go into Madison, you, are you having what your current implants removed then? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So I'll have the current implants removed, they'll remove all of the damage, well, most of the damaged skin that I had from the radiation. Mm -hmm. um, basically what I got was, um, they call capsular contracture, which is, I think that's right. I think I said that right. Um, where like the skin, the, the skin just kept shrinking from radiation. And this is the way my doctor described it is that if you think of like a steak, you buy a steak and it's like a you know nice you know size and then you slap it on the grill and think of how small it ends up getting and radiation is basically doing the same thing to your skin so it's just shrinking and tightening the skin and um and the scar tissue and stuff from that just ends up like 
pulling the implant. So my my one implant is just kind of like pulled way up tight towards my um, uh, collarbone. And so it's just, it's so uncomfortable. Um, so, yeah. So the one good thing that we were all excited about when, when we found out about this, cause we talked about it many times is like, woohoo, you're going to get like these great new boobs and <laughs> we're going to go, we're going to go bigger because we've always wanted big boobs. Right. Do you remember all right. those conversations? <laughs> yeah. And then, and then it was like, oh, <laughs> no, no. You, you, I remember you saying like, no more big boobs. Like, I don't like it like this. <laughs> no, no. Cause, well, and I, cause prior to, I was like a, you know, a cup. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so now I'm like a good big C cup and it's not what it's cracked up. To it's be. not what it's cracked up to be. <laughs> So Melissa, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about like how you've been getting through it. And this is a part that like, we haven't even talked about a lot. And so I know I'm learning a lot of new information, but like there had to be really, really dark moments Mm -hmm. where it just felt like so much dread. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, obviously you can imagine, talk about the stages of grief. I mean, the whole depression thing, it's kind of persistent throughout, um, mostly, you know, during that 2021 being so isolated, I think that my darkest moments were, I realized, and it's easier now looking back than, you know, of course, when you're going through something, but I think part of me was struggling already with the fact that, you know, on top of all of that and being alone, my kids are completely gone. And I was already struggling with the, you know, what's my purpose anymore? You know, not that I, I'm not a mom anymore, but when you don't have somebody that you are, you know, every day looking after, Mm -hmm. worrying about, um, because you know, what's going on with them. Mm -hmm. It was really hard for me. You know, it was like, I had to find a new purpose. Mm. And so I was already kind of struggling with that, which is its own grief, you know, mm-hmm. for right. sure, for yeah. sure. Um, and so that kind of just added another layer to everything that I was going through. Um, and I think the biggest part for me, the hardest part has been, you know, when you when you go through chemo and you lose all of your hair and I had, I had posted something about this one day that it's almost like you're watching yourself disappear Mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, so everything that I had thought about myself, how I identified, you know, with myself just kind of disappeared. And so that along with just already trying to, you know, like to find a new purpose for myself and, And, um, it was, I think that was the toughest and hardest part. And I think going back to the poem, you know, at some point my, my, I was lucky because my friends and my family checked in on me regularly. I mean, they were really there for me. My husband went to every chemo appointment. He was fantastic. Shaved his own head, you Mm -hmm. know, with me. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think eventually got to the point after, after I had gone through all of my treatments and stuff where I knew I still needed to process. And so I had gone and found a therapist who kind of helped, who helped me. And even, even after I felt like I had gotten to that point of acceptance, I realized that there was still something there. And so I started this art therapy, um, class group, um, and the poem actually came out of that. I realized as I was kind of working through some stuff that the thing that kept popping up was anger. Mm. And I don't think I had really gone through and accepted and processed the anger that I had about everything. Um, and so I, I think that's helped, you know, um, yeah. 
Can you tell us a couple of examples of like how the art therapy guided you into processing the anger? Like what kind of activities were you doing where you could access it and then, and then express it? Um, well, it was a lot of the activities were really general in that it was, you know, here's your supplies and stuff, just, you know, grab something, just start scribbling. And then, you know, and then it was like, well, let's add, um, you know, I don't know, just like, let's add a little bit of something else to it or like know, a new material just, or a yeah, new material or, you know, um, uh, we did some, um, you know, just like stop and feel like what's in your body and where are you feeling things? And at one, one time we listened to music and then, you know, had the music kind of guide what we were. Hold on one sec. Okay. We're reconnecting. Okay. Well, life is happening to us today. We just had another technical difficulty. So we are back. Melissa, you were just starting to talk about how the art therapy had really helped. And you started with just, I think you said some scribbling and then kind of just take your story from there. If you don't mind picking it up right there. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so in art therapy, yeah, we would just pick up different materials, um, uh, and just start, you know, scribbling, doing doodling, um, I think I'd said that, you know, sometimes we would listen to music and let the music kind of inform um, what we were doing. We'd try to do some mindfulness where we, you know, closed our eyes and, and got in touch with our body and what we were feeling and, and kind of let that guide um, things as well. And um, so I think, I think what I was saying is that I noticed there was a real kind of dichotomy in what I was drawing and the colors, you know, were kind of fighting. Um, and, and I could tell that every time I looked at it, I was like, I'm, I, there's just something angry here. I can mm. see it. And, and I kept drawing an eye. Um, and so I think it was just that, like that, that staring, I felt like I was just staring at this issue that I still had not kind of dealt with. Oh, that gave me goosebumps. Mm -hmm. And and so you've been out of that art therapy group for a few weeks or a month or so now, as you reflect back on it, have you gotten to a place where you feel like you understand the eye and what it meant? Mm -hmm. I do. In fact, I think that was part of what I had written in the poem is that, um, you know, I feel like this whole cancer thing, you know, everybody says it's you're battling cancer and stuff. And I just never really liked that whole image. And um, because to me, it has been, it's been a staring contest kind of with myself, with this whole idea of who I was before and who I feel like I am now and what I looked like before and what I look like now. And, and, and I had, you know, written in the poem too, I, I couldn't look away because I wasn't sure what side I'm on. And I think that was really that part of, I'm not sure if I fully accepted, you know, where I'm at. I feel like I've got now after going, you know, through that and kind of expressing it that way, I feel like I've, I'm getting to the acceptance part, but I don't feel like I'm fully there yet. I, it, I feel like you kind of have three things going on here. You've got, mm -hmm. you've got, um, oops, hold on. My screen's doing something really crazy. Um, you've got the, you know, the trauma of, um, COVID, which everybody has experienced some trauma in their own way during COVID. You've got the breast cancer, which is just horrible all in and of itself, but going through menopause is such a, an intense, well, maybe it's not for everybody, but all the stories I hear, it changes you. There are lots of things going on in your body. And so to try to sort those three things out and make sense of all three of them, I mean, that's a battle. I mean, yeah. but, but she also had her, her girls leaving too. Oh yeah. Right? Empty nest, empty nest. Yeah. Well, right. they had, yeah. They had been gone for a little bit, but you know, it, it kind of hit me. It was hitting me then mm -hmm. um, as I was going through everything too. And so much of what you, Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, because, um, you know, when I was going through my chemo stuff, my daughter, both of my kids live elsewhere, different States. So oh. I don't even get to see them. Um, and the one had traveled back with her then boyfriend 
um, to let us know that they wanted to get married. And I, I had just gone through a treatment and it was one of the like beginning ones that were kind of major. Mm. And so I couldn't even hug her. Like I couldn't, you know, there we were outside in the snow and they were like, okay, well, we're going to go. And we were like, just, you know, air hugging. And, and then, you know, even her wedding was, I had just gotten, gotten through some of my treatments. And so there was just so much that I missed out on because of all of it too. And I think, and I know, Melissa, you're an open book, because when I called and asked you to be on the show, I, I had talked to you about the different types of grief. And I think it might be helpful for some others to understand this part of your story, too. Before that grief even started, you were trying to have a baby. Yeah. Yeah, I was, um, I was 44, and I had gotten pregnant and, um, and, you know, ended up miscarrying within the first couple of months. Um, and that hit me like super hard, way more than I thought that it should. And I think part of it, you know, is and Amanda knows this. I don't know. My, my husband's 12 years younger than I am and he doesn't have children. Mm-hmm. And so I felt like, man, talking about your body, like fighting against you. I felt like such a failure. Oh just so like, why can't, why can't this happen? You know? And I really struggled. I mean, that part, just like my faith and everything. And so I feel like I maybe just kind of gotten to a point. I mean, it took a long time to where I was like, okay, fine. You know, maybe that's never going to happen. And then the breast cancer hit. And honestly, even though I felt like I had gotten past that, knowing that I was in going through menopause, I'm like, well, there goes that. I mean, that's never happening. Hmm. So, yeah. So you had, you had what we call complex grief. You had multiple grief, multiple layers of grief on top of grief, on top of grief. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the, well, and you know, you know that, I mean, you've had the sim- similar things. I feel like we were both kind of going through a lot of that at the same time. And even, you know, you, you kind of take on other people's grief too. I was listening to a podcast with Brene Brown and, um, oh, what's his name? Kessler. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, and they were talking about, about that, that in our own grief, we, sh- we still have the capacity for empathy and for taking care of other people. Um, But you do end up taking a little bit of that on too. So I know, I mean, everything that you were going through and and other friends that were going through um, just kind of added an extra layer there as well. Yeah. Yeah. So one of your best friends was losing her parents, me. Mm -hmm. And then one of your other really super good friends also had a recent uh, cancer, breast cancer diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Uh We were kind of going through, through things together. But the, and the thing that was weird, and, and we had talked about this too, is that there's so many people who would, who would start to complain about their day or start to complain about how they were feeling or what they were doing or what they were going through. And then they would go, oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't complain. Mm-hmm. And, and I would say, no, I mean, your thing is, is just as important to you and as, as my thing is to me and your grief is, is the main thing for you, you know? Um, so yeah, so there, there was, I think in grief, we tend to like, try to say, well, this person's is up here and then mine's a little bit lower. And then, you know, like I shouldn't feel as bad as they feel and stuff, but that's not true. Comparative yeah, suffering. Renee Brown has a whole podcast on that. Actually. I just listened to it. Um, I'll, uh, put that in the show notes so people can hear her talk about why that is so harmful to people when you minimize the type of grief that they're going through. So Melissa, I wanted to talk about just because I do think it's remarkable what you've been through and that you still find ways to um, be grateful. And Mm -hmm. I know I've I've shared this video and I think you know about this, but there's a a lot of research on post-traumatic growth and how going through like a really difficult time and, and trauma for some people ends up creating a life and a perspective that is stronger and more vibrant 
than before the grief. And I know you're not there yet, but there's parts of you, right? Mm -hmm. That probably look at things very, very differently. So the research on post-traumatic growth um, says that some people turn toward more of an appreciation of life and they're just so thankful and grateful for every every step of the way, right? Mm -hmm. Another another type of post-traumatic growth is they have deeper, more fulfilling connections and relationships with their friends and family. Sometimes people come out of it with seeing new possibilities that they never saw for their life because they they realize that, that life is not infinite, that we all are on a time clock. Some people grow stronger and, and other people go through profound spiritual changes. Does any of that resonate with you? Yeah. For example, for example, I, I automatically go to your gratitude uh, post that you do every day. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I have a gratitude blog that I do. And I had done it a number of years ago. And it happened to be the year my dad passed away. So I was really grateful that I had all of those thoughts, you know, down for the year. Um, and, and once I was diagnosed, I was like, I better resurrect that because I'm going to be, I'm going to have to look for things that make me grateful in my day because, you know, I'm sure there'll be days that I'm not. Um, so I'm trying, I think for me, maybe it's the spiritual side of stuff okay. that's hit me most because I've always thought of myself as a very strong person. Um, and, you know, I'm one of those people who would always be like, okay, like you, you've whined enough, you've complained enough. Now put on your big girl panties and get on with it. You know, like, like give myself a time frame and then be done. Yeah. I immediately after all of this had a really weird sense of doom where, you know, I thought, okay, people go through this and then they're like, I'm recharged for life. You know, like, like you said, like. I can see that there's bigger and better things. And I had a really weird sense of like, no, like, what if, what if this is it, you know, like, um, and fear, like fear that I didn't have before. Um, and I'm sure it was just a combination of, you know, COVID and, and all of that stuff we've already talked about. Um, but kind of starting to get out of that as, as I'm feeling better physically and kind of handling things more, um, you know, processing things more, it's the spiritual side. Like, I'm like, okay, I really, really want to work on that for myself. And I want that to be um, a bigger part of my life. Because so what does that look like for you? Um, I think that's part of the whole finding meaning, you know, for me. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, there's no gratitude in, in the, the trauma and in the pain and stuff that we happen, but it's, I want to grow from it. I want to be a better person. Um, and so I've been, I'm not a big church goer. Like I don't get, I'm kind of, it's mostly because I'm lazy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get up. <laughs> so I right, more right. get dressed and go to church. I mean, there was a little bit of fear, you know, just going into a large, you know, auditorium with a ton of people that yeah. kept me kept me from that. And now I'm like, oh yeah, church at home is pretty nice. Watch <laughs> <laughs> TV. <laughs> yeah, so I just log on and you know listen to that. Mm -hmm. Um, and just I've been trying to like read, you know, more spiritual kind of kind of stuff, um, because I want. I have always wanted to impact and, and, you know, like I wanted my life to have meaning. I don't, I, my whole life isn't just, you know, I feel like it's bigger than me and I've wanted it to be. And I feel like now that there is this, you know, time frame <laughs> of like, yeah, I need to get on with it. So mm -hmm. there's this heightened self, there's this heightened awareness. Yeah. Of, of of time and existential issues and and meaning and purpose and I think that's very common for a lot of people but I appreciate you like finding where you were in that post traumatic growth but then also maybe thinking about like what does that look like for one of those others so 
what what's something that brings you joy these days? What's something that bring gets you out of bed and like how, what do you look forward to? Hmm. Um, you know, I have I've spent so much time at home <laughs> that I'm actually starting to like it a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Like I enjoy um hanging out with my dogs and hanging out. Gary knows all about that. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Mine's sitting right next to me right now. (laughs) My podcast buddy. And and like reconnecting, like really trying to reconnect with friends that I had kind of, you know, just not stayed in touch with that much. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's those things. I'm just looking for the small stuff now. Yes. Well, I am thrilled that you came on to talk to us about this. I think it will help a lot of people. And I just kind of want to end this conversation by going back to the theme of Terry and I's season three, which is on soul sisters. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you, when you think of a soul sister, what are the characteristics of a soul sister? Mm. Well, I, you know what, I guess my initial thought was, um, was kin. Remember when we, <laughs> you and I had that conversation a long time ago, like somebody who is, um, you know, just like, if you had to choose your family, that's the person that you choose. That's, that's the one that you want to be your sister. Aww. I like that. I like oh, that. That's so sweet. <laughs> yeah. I will say, I don't know that you've ever said you wanted me to be your sister, but I did get a present from you this year that says it would be awesome if I was your neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa, I just, I want to thank you for being brave and thank you for sharing your story. And I, this is my favorite example. Um, and I, so I used it a lot, but you know, do you remember like back in the, the days when um, they were doing like the flash dance or the flash mob? <laughs> Um, one woman is brave enough to step out there and share her story in hopes that another woman will be um, helped along in her story by by that. Um, and it creates, you know, it creates yeah. a lot more bravery. So I really appreciate you sharing your heart and sharing just um, everything you've been through. It's, um, it's a blessing for everyone that's listening today. I appreciate you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's been great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I just want to put a challenge out there that I've said it before, but the three of us need to be on a beach somewhere someday or, yes. um, at a- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wait Heck till I yeah. have my tummy tuck and my new boobs. Ooh. <laughs> Is that the title of a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> my tummy tuck and my new boobs. <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you so much, both of you, for spending an hour with us. Sorry about all the technical difficulties, but if that's the biggest problem we have today, then we're we're super blessed. So we are. All right, everybody. Until next week, please remember to take good care of you. Bye. Bye. Well, that's a wrap for this week. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so glad to be here with you. And just remember, we're here to serve. Reach out, connect with us on social media platforms, and dig in deeper. Yes, all those links will be in the podcast show notes. So join us. We can't wait to continue the conversation with you over there. Until next time, everybody, take care.